Roy, thank you for um, being here and joining us today. Uh, I have a few questions for you, um, sleep apnea and your symptoms and your treatment. Um, first, tell me a little bit about your life before treatment. My case is not the perhaps most typical case. I was treated for um, head and neck cancer in 2003. Okay. Before that time, I had no problem sleeping. I loved, well, I, I was a workaholic. I was a research professor, I was a workaholic. But um, sleep was, you know, I was happy when I went to sleep. I didn't sleep very much because I was busy, never an issue. And then uh, immediately after the radiation treatments, I was treated only with radiation. There was essentially no surgery or chemotherapy. I started to have terrible times sleeping, waking up, um, choking, having to rush to the bathroom to pee many times a night. And um, my ENT doctor suspected obstructive sleep apnea in the sleep study. So this was perhaps uh, almost coincidental, but with around the same time and near the end of the radiation treatment. Okay. I forget if that was 2004 or 2003. And of course I was prescribed, I had moderate sleep apnea, obstructive okay. sleep apnea. That was worse when I was on my back versus on my side. Besides. I was uh, el I was considered eligible for CPAP treatment, which, as you know, is considered the gold standards. I was prescribed it. I was actually given uh, APAP, which was was sort of the state of the art at the time. Um, I had enormous difficulty complying with the CPAP. Okay. I would. Uh, uh, well, we could go through the litany of problems, of including getting nasal obstruction, feeling I couldn't exhale. Um, I tried to emphasize the sleeping on my side. Mm -hmm. After about a year of unsuccessful CPAP uh, treatment, unsuccessful in the sense that I, I couldn't Can't sleep with it, it. Yeah. Uh, I was found myself unable. Um, and it's not because I don't understand the disease and it's not that I didn't have enough masks and it's not that the medical profession didn't educate me enough or I or this is too expensive it was nothing like that and that's why I I'm concerned that perhaps there may be other things to explore for the field as well as for me in per in particular as to how to effectively treat sleep I mean, I, I next uh, about a year after the f initial diagnosis. I tried a mandibular advancement device okay. that seemed to help modestly. But by and large, I still suffer in the sense that I wake up multiple times during the night. So anyhow. Even with treatment? Well, the problem in part is that I don't actually have much of a treatment because I can't comply with CPAP. Okay. Um, did, did I answer your question? So, yeah, you actually answered both of my questions already, the first and second. So, um, are you using a mandibular device right now? And no, so well, well, so if we go, I, I gave the early history. May I, should I summarize? Well, since this started, what was that, 15 years ago, there, there may be more history that might be relevant. Um, and some interesting variants of, I, I often go to uh, Denver, Colorado. I, I live, okay. in, I live um, in Baltimore, Maryland. I often go to Denver, Colorado, which, as you know, is a mile Elevation, high and very yeah. dry. There, I find better compliance with CPAP. Really? Because usually it's the opposite. Because I have a heated humidified device. One of the problems with the radiation treatment is I have xerostomia, dryness of the mouth. I don't make yep. saliva. And, and I also have a history of small airways disease from childhood. Um, so. I think that um, the dryness uh, makes it much harder for me to breathe, and the humidity in and of itself, even without the positive airway <laughs> pressure, is helpful to me. Anyhow, I've been struggling. I still struggle, and more recently, because so I was going to Denver, and my and that's when I want my CPAP, and the machine broke. And I needed a new one. They wouldn't give me a new one without a new study. This was... A, about three, four months ago. And in the new study, we've discovered I have a sizable component of central sleep apnea now, which makes the story even more complicated. Yeah. But in any case, uh, so I'm unsuccessfully treated, have tried numerous, I've tried Ambien, I've tried positions. Uh, they've considered this, you know, hypoglossal stimulation, and, you know, because we understand that the, the, 
the muscles and the nerves are failing in a certain sense, but because of the extensive radiation damage, they're reluctant mm. to consider me a candidate for a relatively experimental usage of um, implanted electrodes. So I just struggle along, realizing that it's getting, I'm making myself worse by having the apnea, but I've seemed unable <laughs> to succeed to with any out. of the treatments. Yeah. Oh, got it. Well, my next question was, um, I was going to ask you what has worked and what has not worked. It looks like nothing has worked thus far. Well, the position positioning seems to have done the most for me um, in the sense that I get the... And, and I, I've done extensive documentation of myself. I do agree with one of your panelists whom I had the pleasure of hearing today that... Um, getting feedback about her treatment, how each morning she reviews her CPAP data mm -hmm. to get insights about what was her response over the night. And although I don't use the CPAP, I do use other things like a video camera and a, a health band and... Uh, you monitor your sleep. So I, well, sometimes. I mean, obviously one can't spend one's whole day monitoring right. one's night in an effort to have a higher quality of life. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> be like a shooting your foot or whatever like that. But um, but I do find when I monitor myself more closely that I can adjust my behavior further and that that seems to help. And I have seemed recently in the last few months with that approach seem to have done better at reducing the apneas. My, my doctor uh, is I, I was asking him to switch me from APAP to BiPAP mm -hmm. as an experiment, but um, so BiPAPs might actually work a little bit better since you have central apneas. Right, that was so, the thinking, mm -hmm. and he was debating whether to use oxygen. And, but uh, then I guess he feels we need another that the insurance won't pay for the BiPAP unless we do another sleep Test. study with more details about the titrations and. And I'm worried that if I'm not going to be compliant, I don't want to cause all this trouble. And I, I suppose the BiPAP is, I don't know. I'd like to try BiPAP, but I'm not. At the moment, I, I canceled the sleep, we canceled the sleep study we'd scheduled um, while we continue more behavioral, um, behavioral monitoring and adjustment. And so I wish I knew what to do. With the issues that we've had over the years with the treatment, what sort of advice would you give other people who may have sleep apnea or, you know, afraid to get tested or are in treatment? I mean, this is a very complicated because I guess the, the, there's the typical patient, which would be overweight, older, who just wants to do what they're, doesn't really want to understand necessarily all that, wants to rely on their doctor, understandably, and I can see how the broad advice, you know, use your CPAP, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I can hear, I can s realize that would be the generic advice, which is worth repeating. But I, both for, for sleep apnea and any medical ailment, I would advocate that the patient would do him or herself plus the society a service to try to better understand what their problem is, what are the alternatives for treatment especially in such a chronic disease, mm -hmm. um, to try to explore the alternative, to, to find perhaps the balance of treatment. I mean, for, for many people, it seems they use CPAP, they comply, they're happy the rest of their life, there's never an issue, fine. But for those who, I gather it can be 50% of patients who are non-compliant, I wish there was a way we could work with them so that it wasn't the question of they just disappear because they've been told they're non-compliant yeah. and uh, there's nothing else can be done for them. I, I wish there was a way we could work with them somehow, of which I mean I'm. A <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's it's not selfless. You know, <laughs> I wish yeah. there was a way I could work with some people. I've had I've, I've had strong interest in the role that patients can play in helping one another, given the limited time that the medical professionals have and given how, how much time it takes to understand this disease and cope with it, that patients have the time. Mm -hmm. If they could work together and have whatever online communities, face-to-face -face meetings, support groups, whatever you call it, I think that, I think so if a patient, if they can comply with CPAP and they're happy, 
all the more power to them. If they can't, then I would encourage them to learn more and have one avenue if they're not keen into going to the library and reading about it, is to look for other patients with sleep apnea and, and uh, get uh, insights and support and that support, way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other comments you want to add? Um, well, for the record, not, although I, I'm, I, you made some useful comment. I'd be interested to know what advice you might have. Or, I mean, it was sort of off the, the recording. I don't have any more messages for the general public. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us.